Dans les skis. 3, 2, 1, stop! 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Pour moi, je suis prêt à démarrer les moteurs. Tu vas démarrer en allant dire pour les moteurs. Alors pour le 1, c'est ok pour le 1. Welcome to Airbus. Welcome to the We Make It Fly podcast by Airbus. I'm Martin Aguero. And I'm Jeff Burridge. And in this series, we're bringing you the fascinating stories of the people that have played a part in making Airbus the extraordinary company that it is today. We're here at the uh, Paris Air Show, uh, which is the largest and longest running aerospace trade show in the world. The first one took place in 1908, so it's over 100 years old. And every second year, everybody from the industry gathers here for one week. We're at the end of the week, and it's been a pretty busy air show, right, Jeff? <laughs> You're right there, Martin. My feet haven't touched the ground. We've been here since the weekend. It's now the end of the week. We've seen some amazing things, incredible flying displays every day, and we'll be looking forward to that again later today. But we've met with industries, airlines. We've been announcing orders. We've been launching products partnerships, we've hosted delegations and governments, and it doesn't end there. We've got recruiting days, and the weekend will be public days, so they'll be flooded with the general public coming, looking at the amazing products we've got all around us. One person who is a regular feature here at the Air Show, on our side at Airbus, is certainly Grazia Vitadini, our Chief Technology Officer. Jeff, you've spoken to her before the show about her job, her challenges, and what she's actually doing. So let's hear the tape. Today we're at the headquarters of Airbus. This is the main campus. We're in Toulouse in Blagnac, backing onto the airport. We're in a glass panel building. Has very much that campus vibe with grass and trees all around us. We're here to meet with Grazia Vitadini, CTO, the Chief Technical Officer of Airbus. She's in her office now. We're going to go and knock on her door and have a look. What's around her office? What does a CTO do? And how did she get to where she is today? Good morning, Grazia. Hey, Jeff. Hi. Come on in. Thank you very much. Thanks for seeing us this morning. Hey, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for coming over. Welcome. We'd like to talk about your role, CTO. What does the CTO do? And especially yourself as the first female CTO of Airbus. In fact, the first female on the executive committee of Airbus a year or so ago. But first, we're going to start in your office here. And first time I've been in here, I'm surrounded by memorabilia, people, parts, photos. There's a story in itself here, I'm sure. Maybe the one that we should start with is over here on the wall with a picture of Milan. Absolutely. This is the Duomo di Milano. It's the cathedral of my city, the place where I was born, Milano, with the Frecce Tricolori, so our aerobatic um, team. And uh, this is where it all started. This is where I was born. So how does a Italian girl end up being the CTO of Airbus? How did it all start for you? <laughs> Very good question. It started with, I guess, the first three words I I spoke out as a, as a child. So, mamma, papa, and aeroplano. That was the third. <laughs> Meaning I've, um, I'm born with a, a passion for all what is aviation. So, uh, building models at a very young age, balsa aircraft, and then of course wanting to be a pilot and getting a no as an answer from the Italian Air Force. At that time, women could not uh, fly uh, in, the, in the Air Force in Italy. Now things have changed. But at that time, the first reply was a no. And so that's where I thought, you know, okay, I can't fly your aircraft, well, I will build them. And that's what prompted me to go into engineering. Um, I'm an aerodynamicist, so aeronautical engineer specialized in aerodynamics. Always worked more on the structural part of, uh, of aircraft. Started out in Italy on the Eurofighter and uh, in 2000 left Italy for Germany. Small parenthesis in the south of Germany and then landed at Airbus in 2002. And let's move over here. We have. Um We're also looking at many pictures of teams. I think people, it's clear, that mean a lot to you in terms of those relationships and also trophies. And I'm just reaching up, getting one now. Femme de l'année, Woman of the Year for 2018. I mean, Airbus is celebrating its 50th year pioneering progress. 
in a way you're also a pioneer in in the diversity that you bring to the company and what you achieve and and that's something that's important for you that's important to me in very many different ways um, first of all Airbus and I were born the same year, so the 50th birthday of, of Airbus echoes very much with me. And the idea also of keeping that pioneering spirit alive, which allowed us 50 years ago um, to start from scratch with a, a visionary idea. And they came back to Europe and built it, and that was the A300B. This is the very thing we should never forget. This is where how we were born, and uh, we have to keep the very same ambitious spirit and also integrative mindset, putting together the very best pal- talent, no matter what color, what gender, what nationality, what background, just to keep that spirit alive and enable us to maintain our competitive advantage when it comes to innovation. Okay, so let's, I'm just gonna reach up and get this frame here. Thank oh, you for your yeah. warm-hearted and honest contribution to our No Blame, No Shame event. That must mean something to you. This was um, a couple of years ago when I was head of engineering at uh, Defense and Space. We started a series of, uh, of sessions where leaders would uh, stand up on stage and just talk about failures, personal, professional failures, and how these contributed to, you know, learning and, 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 and developing oneself. This is something which I believe is fundamental in an organization which to me needs to be fearless to really be a high-performing team. So this is what I strive for in all my teams, giving, making sure that we create the conditions for everybody to speak about pretty much anything and also learn from collective or personal uh, failures without any whatsoever blame. So we've seen your CV, Grazia, in, in 3D, in, in photos, in memorabilia. Let's go down to the fine assembly line of 380 and see what practically it means on a day-to-day building aircraft, in this case, the A380. Okay, so we're now, Grazia, we're at the entrance to the final assembly line of the A380, where most or all of the final assembly pieces come in through, through the entrance in front of us, and we're gonna walk now through the entrance, and we're gonna go into where they start building on the final assembly line. Let's take a walk. Let's go see the A380. Another amazing experience that I'm having in this series, Grazia. I mean, this time we're in the cathedral of the A380 final assembly line, bigger than anything I think we've ever seen before. I'm looking at one wing, which is 80 meters across. So by the time you put the other wing on and the fuselage, it's a football field width of aircraft alone, plus the building around it. But what do you feel when you come into a a space like this? This place is very dear to my heart because on this very site, at this assembly station, this is where I came for the very first time to Toulouse from Hamburg when I was um, still a, a design engineer. At, uh, at Airbus. So the very first time I arrived, the factory had just been built. I still had a badge which said Daimler Kreisler Aerospace. That was the German part of Airbus before we became really one, one integrated company, right? And uh, nobody knew where this place was, so it did take me quite some time to come over. That was my very first experience on this very um, station, which then became, years after, my, my home base. Because when I became chief engineer on the, on the high lift devices, on the movable parts on the wing, this is where they come in from Bremen and that's where they are installed on the wing before the wing goes up onto the fuselage. So this is where it was all happening for me back in the days. And so this place is absolutely, I'm very emotional even today, coming back to it. It's, it's something you. very dear to my heart. Okay, so we're walking along um, close to the wing rats here, and could you just explain more about the movable parts to those that aren't so aware of what that can mean? Absolutely. So when you see how birds land, 
they they tend to cup their wings. The wings become from you know the the, the smooth um, straight profile they use when they are in cruise. Let's say when they they land, they they cup them. The the profiles get more and more curved to allow them to fly safe at lower speeds, and that's what we try to do exactly on our aircraft. So we try to modify the geometry of the wing to mimic what Mother Nature does in order to enable us to fly slow and safe during takeoff and landing phases. So that's why we modify the leading edge of the wing with, with slats and the trailing edge with the flaps. These are the, the movables, leading and trailing edge movables. So your first role in Airbus was on the A380, I and mean, that was quite an introduction for you personally, I imagine. Absolutely. Um, and actually, it was on parts which were never installed on the A380, but made it to the A350. So we did develop, we did study the opportunity of installing carbon fiber window frames instead of the metallic ones on the A380. Then it didn't, it didn't work, but it did on the A350 some years later. That was my very first uh, job at Airbus. Then I passed on the, the skin of the German section uh, of the fuselage. And that was the first time I ever came on this very station during the join up of uh, fuselage sections from Germany and France, because there were some tolerancing issues. So the fit was not exactly as planned. The 380 wasn't without its issues in these early days. The most notable um, issues arise with the cables on the fuselage part. So I did witness it. I did witness also the difficulties of having different systems to design your own aircraft, which do not ease different national systems, which do not ease having smooth interfaces, right? And that's where the cabling issue arose, having chunks of fuselage done in different countries with systems which were not seamlessly compatible with each other. And that's something we did address and fix then on the A350. How long were you working in this area for Grazia? It was around about five years, so basically from the first flight of the A380, taking it through um, the um, flight test campaign, which was a, a very enriching and challenging phase, and then experience in service experience with the first customers, yes. And how did you feel about that first flight? Oh gosh, I ended up crying in the arms of a colleagues I have never seen before. <laughs> so first flights can be absolutely incredibly emotional and rewarding moments. And how did you feel personally, you know, the transition from Bremen to Toulouse in that more international environment, you know, right around you every day? That was uh, absolutely enriching and also totally fascinating because I'm Italian. So I really don't belong to any, <laughs> to any bit of work share, right? So being a bit neutral and at the same time profiting from this incredibly rich and diverse and vibrant uh, environment and group of people, right, was, was for me an unforgettable experience. This was for me the real first taste of Airbus as an international company as we know it today. And not only from an international perspective, but also from discipline viewpoint. So engineering together with production, together with systems, installation, all coming together on one side. So interdisciplinary, intercultural. So what's your favorite part of this building, the fine assembly line? Well, definitely the aircraft in it. <laughs> in particular, I must confess, I have a favorite part on the aircraft, <laughs> which is um, the inner flap. So the wing has three flaps. The inner flap is metallic, then you have a mid and an outer flap in a composite material. When you look at the A380 from behind, and you look at that wonderful curvature of the wing, that sort of seagull profile, which you see wonderfully from this station. That specific curvature um, at the attachment between the fuselage and the wing is given by the inner flap, which is for me um, simply beautiful 
to look at and extremely efficient aerodynamically. We're coming to the end of this part of um, our talk, Grazia, and what's amazing as well is what we're, where we are today is just the first station of the final assembly line. This isn't where it finishes at all, it's where it begins. And then we go beyond this building into another huge building, bigger in fact, yeah. because uh, it's where we have the line following down to the, to the aircraft goes out the door fully complete the other end. And there's not only one, there's two lines because we have this aircraft on this side and we have a second aircraft opposite. You have to see it to believe it, I think. And it's another special place in Airbus's uh, many different sites that we have that leave you in awe, I would say, of, of what you see. Do you still feel that? Absolutely. There's a part of me feeling at home here. This is where my own adventure began at Airbus. This is where I feel... I was professionally born, so this place will always hold a special, a special spot in my heart. So we've left the 380 foul, the final assembly line, and we're on our way to a disco, which in our terms is the disruptive cockpit of the future. And it's another example of some of the innovations that we're undertaking as a company at Airbus today and that are under Grazia's responsibilities. We're on the research and technology plateau now, so this is where all the research and technology teams are, are working on the Toulouse site. We're Meetings on, either yeah. side of us. Laboratories, simulators such as the one we're about to enter. Okay, and we're in the uh, big room and I'm looking at a simulator cockpit not too dissimilar to a normal cockpit that we look at in terms of size or, or scale we've got a black interior but big difference is there's one seat in the middle very well spotted because this is our disruptive cockpit simulator where we test the possible configuration to support single pilot operations on our fleet so this is a fundamental milestone on our autonomy technology development roadmap so we have with the ultimate ambition of having one day possibly a fully autonomous aircraft we have different steps along the way and the single pilot operations is definitely something quite realistic okay so let's have a closer look at what we're seeing and now in the cockpit 40, 30, 20, and 10, we're looking at four screens five, or three screens around the central chair. Grazia, what's, what can we see on these screens? We have side sticks, as you would expect. What you see now, so it's all a digital type of, uh, of setting, where in the panels, the cockpit has in front uh, of him or her, uh, you have all the information needed to aviate, navigate, and communicate. These are the three priorities of a, of a pilot. Why this? Why do we want to go to one pilot only in the cockpit? The demand for air travel is growing at three times the pace of economy. It means we may be very well facing scarcity of pilots. Today we have around about 200,000 type rated pilots. And we may very well need in the next 20 years up to 600,000. So the question uh, is, okay, what can we do to support this growth? There's different answers to that. One is increasing maybe the diversity also in the cockpit. Today, only 5% of commercial pilots are women. So we could act upon that. And from technology viewpoint, the plan is to ensure absolutely the same standard of safety, if not an even better one, by having one single pilot 
in the cockpit, aided by automated systems. Retard. 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 How much of your job is about imagining the impossible? Well, it is the subtitle of my job, <laughs> absolutely. So um, being responsible for the identification, development, acceleration, and maturation of technologies who maybe, which maybe do not exist yet for the products of a future which is not foreseeable is absolutely my, is my mission, right? So it's important to be able to imagine the impossible and then to pave the way to achieving the impossible in a very realistic step-by-step -step approach. This is the way we develop technologies. Grazie. So we've had a great walk around the FAL. We've had a great look at the disco today. Personally, what does this mean for you? It, it was also very moving for me to revisit with you all the steps of my journey. I'm, I'm an Airbus kid. I was born in this very company. And now um, the chief technology officer of an awesome company serving all its products across its divisions worldwide. What's been absolutely fascinating, exciting and fundamental in each single step of my development was not only taking care of the technical and technological aspects, but also really caring for the human component of the job. That's fascinating, Jeff. It's clear from the tape that you know she has lots on her plate and she's an interesting person with a tremendous career. Yeah, she's a fascinating character, Martin. And she's been uh, having a really busy week. At the start of the week, she and six other CTOs signed an agreement on sustainability, targeting a reduction in CO2 emissions. And you know we have to meet these targets. We know the environmental topic is right on the table, front and center for all of us, and we take that very seriously. I'm fascinated also by the push to really work on this. I mean, incredibly pushing for cutting emissions as a key driver for our future growth. And that's just one thing. Grazia's responsibility goes well beyond that as well. We're looking to the future a big time. I'm standing on the Airbus Static. I'm surrounded by drones of all sorts of different shapes and sizes. The one that's really impressive is the Vahana. That's a self-piloted aircraft. It's already been flown over 70 times. Three years ago, it was just um, a picture on the back of a napkin. It's amazing what can be done when we, when we put our heads together and really start to think of the future and plan for the future. Well, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of this episode of We Make It Fly and also the air show, Martin. If you've enjoyed this podcast, like and review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe. You can follow us all on social media. Use the hashtag WeMakeItFly to get in touch with us and give us your feedback. Good, bad, we don't mind. We want to know what you think. This program was made by Earshot Strategies. The executive producer is Richard Myron and the other production undertaken by Anouk Mie. I'm Jeff Burridge and I was joined by Martin Aguera. Thanks for listening. Okay.